From the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., this is the Tyler's Place Podcast. I'm your host, Maynard Edwards, 32nd Degree KCCH, and we're brought to you by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, Mother Supreme Council of the World. You can find out more at scottishrite.org. And if you're a brother of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction, when you log in, don't forget to check out some of the new Master Craftsman stuff and morals and dogma the audiobook it is streaming for free for members only however you can also purchase it to download at audible so if you're an audible subscriber it's one credit and if you're not an audible subscriber you can either sign up or purchase it outright for the morals and dogma audiobook so make sure you check that out admiral gene sizemore he is a mentor to so many of our leaders in the Scottish Rite. Admiral Jean is literally spent a lifetime in serving our country, first in the Navy and then serving the fraternity as our Grand Executive Director, a job that he passed on to his son, our current Grand Executive Director, Admiral Bill Sizemore. I've been wanting to sit down and talk to him about his service to the country, his legacy of service in the Scottish Rite that extends not only to his son, but also his grandkids serving the Scottish Rite. So we want to talk about all of those things and a real honor to get and sit down finally with Admiral Gene Sizemore. Admiral, I want to start at the beginning. It's an honor to speak to you. Let's let's start at the very, very top. Where were you born? Where were you raised? Give us a little of your early history, if you could. I, I grew up in Lawrenceville, Illinois, which is a, a real nice town of about 5,000, located about 250 miles south of Chicago, and 150 miles east of St. Louis. So we're right on the Indiana border. And my wife and I are from the same uh, locale. And so you uh, you grew up there and and you educated there and uh, and at some point in in at, at, while you were there you, you you enlisted in the Navy so tell us a little bit about that what uh, what 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 got you into the United States Navy? Well, this is during World War II. Sure. My dad, who was a Mason, um, was in the South Pacific on an aircraft carrier. And uh, it was just kind of a wartime atmosphere. So um, he, uh, his ship, the USS Intrepid, was hit by kamikazes and they came to the West Coast for repairs and he was able to come home for Christmas. And so while he was home, I convinced him I should join the Navy and I did during the Christmas uh, vacation from high school. Now, why did you have to convince your dad because he was in the Navy. Why did you have to convince him that you wanted to join the Navy? Well, I was only 17 and, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. He wanted me to finish high school and uh, I was raring to go. So I did. I joined uh, on Christmas vacation and uh, I joined up for a combat air crewman type uh, training, which involved boot camp and then aviation radioman school. And while I was in radioman school, I had the opportunity to apply for an uh, aviator program. And I had to be a high school graduate to do that. So I convinced my principal back in Lawrenceville to uh, write in a letter that I was going to graduate with my class in, in June. He did, and I passed and got into the Navy's V-5 program and began the college part of that on the first day of July, 1945. And uh, that's how I got started. So that's the birth of your military career. How did you get involved with the Masonic fraternity? When I uh, graduated from flight training, became a Naval aviator in 1948, I came home on leave. My dad had told me years ago, before that, that when I came of age, he wanted me to join the Masons. And I did. I, I joined in, I guess it was Master Mason, uh, early November or late October, 1948. So I, this year I will have been a Mason 73 years. When did your Masonic journey extend into the Scottish Rite? Well, I was in a, a Navy fighter squadron on the West Coast, and my neighbor, 
um, was uh, saw my ring. I had a Masonic ring I wore, my dad had given me, and uh, convinced me to join the Scottish Rite. And I, I checked with my dad, who, of course, was uh, out of the Navy by that time, 1955. And uh, he thought it was a good idea. So I, uh, I joined the Scottish Rite in San Jose, California. And um, that was, uh, how many years ago was that? 45, 65, 60, about 68 years ago. So you served the country in the Navy throughout the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and then you come to retire in the early 80s and you get more involved with the Scottish Rite, if I am kind of reading the history correctly. Tell us how you made that leap from uh, being a naval officer, being an admiral in the Navy, to becoming such a, uh, an important part of the Scottish Rite Southern jurisdiction. At that time, I retired in 1982. I knew uh, Fred Kleinconnect, who at that time was uh, Secretary General, Grand Secretary General of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. <clears throat> I met him through National Sojourners. Uh, I've been the National President of National Sojourners. And um, he invited me over to talk to um, Mr. Clausen, who was our Sovereign Grand Commander at the time, who asked me if I would uh, volunteer to be the uh, Americanism education uh, leader there at the headquarters. At the time, it was held by General Johnson, a former chief of staff of the Army, who was uh, had uh, cancer. He wanted me to maybe help him, and I agreed to do that. And then General Johnson uh, died almost immediately, and I volunteered in that job for. 30 years, I guess. So you actually spent 30 years as a volunteer. How did that volunteer job translate into uh, what is this, what became, I know it wasn't called this originally, what became the grand executive director's position? Well, I, mean, I, I love being a volunteer over there and I had another job. So I'd go over on Saturdays or sometimes at six in the morning to get some work done before I had to report my regular job in Arlington. The fellow who had the job before me, Bo Bowman, uh, came sick uh, unexpectedly and passed away. So I was asked uh, uh, to see if I would be interested in the job. And um, it took some time for me to think about it because I had a good job. But I agreed and I became uh, what is now the executive director position. And uh, it was the best, best move I ever made after retirement. It was a wonderful job working with wonderful people. As a dad, it has to be very special for you that uh, that your son, Admiral Bill Sizemore, who's our current Grand Executive Director, chose to follow you not only in the Navy as a pilot, but then on into your, you know, air quotes here, retirement career in the Scottish Rite. Talk a little bit about uh, about Bill and about uh, about how some of that came about. I think Bill really liked airplanes and... Uh... He still really likes airplanes. Yeah, <laughs> he, uh, he would see me come and go and uh, thought that was pretty cool, I guess. And uh, even I get excited to see a, a jet fighter run down the runway and into the air. And, uh, and so he, he uh, applied for the Naval Academy and was accepted. Must have surprise of both of us. <laughs> <laughs> he he, uh, he really liked it, I found out. And, uh, and so he succeeded very well in the Navy as a fighter pilot and as a squadron commander, as air wing commander, and chief of naval air training, finally. And uh, I believe he watched me and my job as the executive director and thought that uh, that might be something he'd like to do. 
when he retired and it just worked out that uh, Mr. Seal thought that would be a good idea too and they convinced him to follow me on the job. I stayed on a little bit longer than I probably should have, but they're waiting for him to retire. <laughs> so. As a dad, how, how did that make you feel? It was thrilling that he'd want to do that, and he, he did so well uh, in those positions. I, still, I guess he still is. I, he likes it, I know. And uh, it's a, it really was a, a wonderful thing for me to, to work with all you Scottish Rite guys for all these years and be able to travel around and see Scottish Rite and Europe and uh, Far East and in the United States as well. It's, um, I just have, I have more friends in the sky right than I ever had in the Navy, actually. And I, of course, I outlived my close friends in the Navy, unfortunately. As you look back over your career, not only in the right, but also in the Navy, and all the many things you've accomplished, what what do you think about? What kind of gives you a little bit of pause? Well, I look back over over my career in life. I, I think it's remarkable, in my opinion, <laughs> for a, a kid from Archville, Illinois, who joined the Navy as a seaman, who worked his way up to be an admiral, and then uh, to got me involved in the, in the Masonic fraternity at the urging of my father, actually. Uh, it was just a wonderful step forward. I've been proud of that. And uh, I'm proud of my family. I, I, I'm proud of the staff over there at the Scottish Rite. But I, I've made so many friends through my association with the Scottish Rite that uh, I, I just, it's, it's unbelievable to me that I lucked out so so well in the whole, the whole thing. And then, Hell and I are still together. We've been married now for this year will be uh, 70, uh, 71 years. And we're both in fairly good shape and uh, enjoying life. So since your first retirement from the military just kind of led you to another job, even if it was a job with the Scottish Rite, it's still a job. Now you're really retired. Uh, where are you now? So um, we, and we have a very fine place to live. And I, Good neighbor, our kids are nearby. My granddaughter's work in DC and my two sons are close by. So it's really worked out well for us. A lot to be thankful for. If you could speak to some of the young men in the service now and, and talk to them about perhaps joining the Masonic fraternity, becoming involved with their lodge, if they're already members or taking that jump from Blue Lodge to Scottish Rite, what would you say to them? <laughs> Don't hesitate. There are some bumps along the way, I suppose. Depends. Uh, my lodge back in Lawrence, Illinois, has, um, has really been a fine lodge all these many years. They've, they celebrate, I guess, 150 years or more. And um, I still hear from them. They have, they, I'm informed of every meeting and every special event by that system where all members are called and the, and the voice messages is left. Then I joined the local lodge here in Arlington when I retired and eventually became the master of the lodge. And I still have lots of connections there. And so I just can't speak high, <laughs> any higher of, of the whole system than to say that it's something I'm sure glad I, I did. Is there something about your military career that you know, particularly look back on with fondness? I admit that I, you know, I flew missions in the Korean War and, of course, in the Vietnam War off of aircraft carriers. And, you know, it was a, it was the best thing, one of the best things I ever did was get into a Navy carrier aviation. And I really liked flying off aircraft carriers and uh, didn't much like it in the rain or at night. But, um, you know, you just kind of do it. And I love flying with airplanes. And so I, I loved aviation. I, I soloed in high school. Preparation, I think that helped me when I was interviewed for the various things, starting out in the Navy. 
I've heard a few stories here in the halls of the House of the Temple about your time serving in a diplomatic post uh, in the Soviet Union during the height of the Cold War. I did. We, Helen and I went to Russia. I was at the defense attache and a uh, senior aide to the ambassador. And, uh, you know, the Navy sent me to college. And so I, I graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, in political science. And I took Russian at the time. So at the right time, my name popped up and I got that job in Soviet Union. And uh, that was also a remarkable period in our lives. We, we traveled the length and breadth of what is now Russia and, and all its uh, little countries that's now alongside of Russia. And um, of course, you'll never forget those, those adventures and many of more adventures. And uh, so that's just one of those uh, fortunate things that comes along. We were able to see the other side and see the enemy those guys supplied equipment to my adversaries in, in, in Vietnam and in, uh, in Korea. Right. And, uh, but when you get to know them, they're very friendly, nice people. But they, they're just doing what they do, and we're doing what we do. Of course, the cocktail parties are fun as heck. <laughs> <laughs> they drink like, like uh, you know. And they die early. <laughs> you don't understand why. Russia is a fantastic place. And really big. And I still love reading about it and seeing pictures of it. Right. And in fact, I'm reading a rereading a biography of Stalin at this very time. At the time, we always say it was an interesting tour. It wasn't a lot of fun but it certainly was educational. And um, the people who we met were nice people. So did you run into the, like the KGB and the, the cloak and dagger types from, from the, like the, the guys from the, the movies almost? All the time, every day. The people we, our staff were all cleared by the KGB and had to report on us. We had uh, our apartment, uh, we had a nice apartment in the embassy. We figured it was bugged. You, you could go through and clear it, and a couple of days later, it was probably bugged again. So right. we lived under that all the time, and in our cars as well. Right. All our trips had to be cleared, we had to fly two weeks ahead of time to, to move out of Moscow on any trip. Mm -hmm. You never knew where it was approved. You just, you just assumed it would be, and uh, sometimes it was disapproved when you got to the airport, and most of the time we were able to go ahead and do what we planned to do. And we were met, uh, met every time by people who worked with the KGB when we landed wherever it was. Right. As I said, we flew, we moved uh, about the the country from border to border, north and south and east and west. I know you also did a, a fair amount of travel with the Scottish Rite in your role as Grand Executive Director as well. The Scottish Rite, we traveled all over the place. We went to Korea, uh, Tokyo two or three times, Okinawa, Guam, Taiwan, Hong Kong, <laughs> Hawaii a lot, Alaska. The sky's right everywhere. Of course, it's in Russia too now, and uh, it has been for several years. You, you, you got to be proud to be members of the Sky Shrine or the Masons, because also they're everywhere and they're all nice folk. Admiral Gene Sizemore, a legacy of service not only to the Scottish Rite, but also to our country. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and, and just a real thrill to talk to you. I hope that we can uh, connect again very soon and, and uh, continue this conversation. I, I'm sure you've got a few 
more war stories to share, so to speak, and also a few Scottish Rite stories to share. So thank you so much for joining us. That's going to wrap it up for the Tyler's Place podcast featuring Admiral Gene Sizemore, our Grand Executive Director Emeritus, and uh, just a wonderful guy. Uh, Such a thrill to finally get down and chat with him. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Tyler's Place podcast. If you've got something you want us to talk about or uh, you want to tackle, send me an email, easy to get, podcast at scottishrite.org. If you're interested in becoming a Freemason or in becoming a part of the Scottish Rite, that same email address gets it done, podcast at scottishrite.org. From the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., I'm your host, Maynard Edwards, 32nd Degree, KCCH, and I will catch you next time right here on the Tyler's Place 